All right, you guys ready? Yes. Awesome. Well, let's um, pray. Dear Jesus, as we jump into your word, we ask that you would um, speak to our hearts. Dear God, I know that we come in today from many different walks of life. Um, some of us are doing well and we're loving you and things are great. For some of us, we're struggling. For some of us, we don't know you maybe. Um, I ask and pray, dear God, that today your word would speak specifically to our hearts, that your Holy Spirit would work and, and move um, in, in such a way and where there are areas that we um, forget or areas that uh, we don't speak on, maybe that your Holy Spirit would make intercession on our behalf. We um, give you this morning, dear God, knowing your word will never return void. In Jesus' name, and all God's people would say, amen. Amen. Well, many of you are familiar with uh, the old childhood saying, um, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. It's a, it's a saying that's usually said on the, the playground, um, you know, when kids are playing kickball, or you know, it's typically where um, teasing is taking place. Uh, the saying is meant to remind us that words are never going to hurt me, you know, and, and I remember being a little kid, um, like, Jumping back, well, yeah, well, I'm, I'm rubber, you're glue, whatever you say bounces off of me and sticks onto you, you know, and, and just like to try to get back. And, and the thought line is like, well, words are never going to hurt us. But the reality is, is that words do have a profound effect on our lives. Um, while words might not necessarily break our bones, they definitely um, can wound us. They can hurt our hearts, you could say. Words are big. They can do um, great and amazing things by building people up, but they can also tear people down. Uh, words can exonerate a person or condemn a person or bring hope or despair. Words um, can cut deep, you know, cut me deep, Shrek, cut me deep. You know, like, you know, words, words are, they can hurt. Um, and, and so how do we as believers maintain a joy in the midst of um, criticism, when people are using words against us, um, in the midst of opposition, you know, sometimes those words can linger for years. Uh, the things that maybe a parent told us many, many years ago can, you know, just in an off, you know, the cuff remark, could just really hurt us deep down inside. And I, I think one of the ways we maintain joy in the midst of criticism and words and things like that is by remembering that this life isn't a playground, but re really a battleground. And that as believers, you are going to face opposition. You're going to face criticism uh, because simply you love God. And as you begin to carry out God's purpose in your life and, and his dreams for your life, you need to remember that you will have a bullseye on your back from a very real and present enemy who wants to take you out of the game. He wants to remove you from um, living the, the victorious Christian life, from living a joyful Christian life. And whenever God's people are on the rise, you can be certain that Satan's on the rise to stop them. Satan and his cohorts will oppose you where you are doing God's will, when you're doing God's will. And instead of allowing the devil and or the enemy to... Um, drive you to destruction or drive you to depression or drive you to a place of sadness, rather um, facing those things with courage and joy. And that's what we see today in Philippians chapter 1, verse 27 through 30. In the message I've titled, Joy in Opposition. And we're going to be looking at three things, or really three tools that Paul the Apostle gives us for maintaining joy in the midst of opposition, criticism, suffering, so on and so forth. And, and we're going to look at verse 27, uh, teamwork, that God has given us a team, uh, a church, brothers and sisters in Christ to rely on, um, to have one another's back. The second point we're going to look at is verse 28, homework. Or really that as believers, we've got to do our homework and really know um, how to stand against the attacks of the enemy, how to, how to withstand those things. And then finally, uh, verse 29 through 30, firework. That ultimately, whether you are a young Christian or an old Christian, 
we are going to suffer. And so might as well let that thing shine like fireworks as best as possible. Now, if this is your first time or you haven't been in a while, I like to just recap where we've been so we're all moving in the the right direction just because I don't want anybody to be left behind. We are currently in the New Testament book of Philippians in a series that we've titled The Struggle is Real. And the reason why we titled that is because, well, the reality is, is whether um, you are young or old, black or white, male or female, um, you know, whatever the case, we are all either um, going into a trial, in the middle of a trial, or coming out of a trial. Uh, you're at one of three places in your life. Everybody goes through pain, struggles, suffering, hardships, and so on. And, and Paul the Apostle writes to the church at Philippi talking about maintaining joy, having gladness of heart, happiness, um, no matter the situation, no matter what's going on, no matter the, the, the people, no matter the things, no matter uh, the, the areas around you, and so on. And, and he writes to them with a peculiar situation, well, because he is currently in the middle of a trial. He is in jail when he is writing the letter. He is on death row, doesn't know whether he's going to be set free or martyred for Christ. And so he has a keen awareness of, of what really um, having joy in the midst of a trial can, can look like. And, and so he writes to them, and thus far we've seen uh, finding joy when you're lonely, finding joy in ministry, um, finding joy... In, in many different areas, and today we're going to look at finding joy in opposition. So notice our first point, verse 27, homework, or sorry, teamwork. It says, only let your conduct be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or am absent, I hear of your affairs that you stand fast in one spirit with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. Paul starts out by saying that he's heard about how this church is doing well. Remember, this was a church that Paul planted. Uh, this was a church that he led a lady by the name of Lydia to the Lord. She was a, a dealer in purple in that day. Uh, she was the local Louis Vuitton dealer of the day. You know, she, she, uh, was in the fashion industry. Um, we see a young slave girl get saved and a Roman soldier get saved. Um, these are people that Paul leads and baptizes and, and the church starts in Lydia's home. I mean, he loved this church dearly. And now that he's in jail alone and isolated from them, he really understands and sees um, how well they're doing even in his absence. And he says, I hear that you guys are doing great. I, I hear that you're doing so well. Paul would address the Corinthians this same way in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 2. He would say, our, um, you are our letters written in our hearts, known and read by all men. That quite literally, the life you live is an indication of, of, of the ministry that's happened in your life, the, the, is an indication of, of Jesus in your life, and there really is no substitute for a life well lived. Um, for the Christian, we need to remember and, and, and see that the life that we live here on this earth is an opportunity to preach the gospel to our friends and our family and our neighbors and our enemies even. That we let our light shine before men by the way that we live. This is why Paul would say, let your conduct be worthy of the gospel. That the way you act and the things you say, that quite literally what you believe determines how you behave. Uh, it determines how you live. And so Paul, in a Roman prison cell, has heard about this church. Has heard how they're doing, how well they're doing, how great things are. Their conduct and affairs and one mind and one spirit. As believers, we are called to live a certain way because ultimately our citizenship isn't of this earth, but it's in heaven, right? We're, we're citizens of heaven. We're just kind of living in, on this you know, colony uh, for, for a time. And this would have been very meaningful for the church at Philippi because, remember, Philippi was a, a Roman military colony. 
It was a Rome away from Rome. It was very much what Guam and Puerto Rico are to the United States for the, the empire of Rome. And, and being a citizen of Rome, you got certain benefits and certain privileges. You, know, you got the Roman road. Um, you got the Pax Romana or the Roman enforced peace. Um, every Roman uh, city, if uh, you go to the footsteps of Paul with us, um, you'll see uh, the ancient city of Philippi uh, today is, is ruins. But one of the major things that every Roman city had was an amphitheater. And you'll see these amphitheaters in all these old Roman cities. Why? Because the games and theater were a big part of Roman culture. You see aqueducts and, and uh, water flowing into the cities and even sewer systems and, and so on. Um, bathhouses so that you can be clean. These were all the benefits and privileges of being a Roman citizen, uh, being able to, you know, take a bath and, and not be stinky. And, you know, right, like those were awesome things. And as Christians, being citizens of heaven, we get special privileges as well. But we also have great responsibility as well. Colossians 1.13 says this, that he's delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of his son. And so if we've been pulled from the power of darkness, we have a great responsibility to let the light shine and allow the kingdom of, of Jesus be glorified. So the way we live and the things we do and how we act, our life, our love, our liberty, our humility, it should always be on display. It should always be on display. You know, we, uh, I don't know if you, if you know this, but uh, as Americans, we kind of get a bad rap when we travel. Um, sometimes other countries aren't so stoked on Americans as we travel because, you know, we want our big gulps big. And most like countries in Europe, the large is like this big, you know, um, and we're like, that's not how we do it at home and, and so on. And, and it kind of, it drives some people, you know, nuts. We're kind of loud sometimes and obnoxious sometimes. And um, when we were on the footsteps uh, tour a couple weeks ago, we were um, in Greece and uh, we were, the way that it works is uh, we were on a boat and, and you get tickets. Um, and we had a private tour to go like see Patmos and, and, and see where uh, John received the book of Revelation and, and so on. And um, uh, you get your tickets and you get um, called in certain orders, group one, group two, because it's all based off of your bus and, and you know, what bus you're going to get onto and so on and so forth. And, and uh, there was a gentleman, probably 65 years old, um, right behind our group, Mile High Calvary, and uh, um, he didn't have his ticket. He was supposed to be in another group that was like getting off a, a little bit later. And, uh, and he was um, arguing with the lady. And the lady was like, you know, sir, I'm so sorry, but you can't. You're, you're not in this group to get off. You need to wait your turn to get off later on. He's like, I don't want to wait my turn. You know, and, and, and she, she was like, sir, you know, she was trying to like be really nice, you know, um, uh, you can tell she didn't speak English too well, you know, but she was trying to, sir, we're letting certain people, I don't want to wait my turn. I'm an American. I want to get off now. And I want to like turn around and be like, dude, you know, and like the rest of like uh, for a little bit of part of the trip, like some of us, like we'd look at each other and be like, I don't want to wait my turn, you know, like just to, but <laughs> I just, you know, it just made me cringe. You, do you know what I mean? Why? Because, like, that's just not indicative of who we are as Americans. We want to be not, we're kind, nice, loving, like, you know, man. Uh, and, and so it was just, it just kind of made me cringe a little bit. And so as believers, as citizens of heaven, making sure that we aren't doing anything that are making other people cringe. You know what I mean? That, that the way we live, the things we say, how we do it, and so on and so forth, isn't, isn't living our lives, well, me first, and, and I don't want to wait, you know, and I want my, and, and, but making sure that we are, are being kind and loving and, 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 and being humble. And, and it's kind of hard to say I'm, I'm being humble, like I would like to now announce I'm humble, um, because, <laughs> because you can't. But at least, at least pursuing humility in our everyday life as believers, that we're pursuing um, humility in the way that we live and we approach our life. Because remember, Christianity is different. And as citizens of heaven, we're called to be different. We, we're, we're not called to, to be first, 
The first shall be last, right? The last shall be first. Um, we're, we're called by Jesus to die in order to live. We're called to give so that we can keep, right? We're called to, to a different lifestyle and a different set of standards. And so this is why Paul says, let your conduct be worthy of the gospel. The way you live and the things you do and the things you say. And I'll say this, just as a, just a little bit of a side note and kind of as a, a not a rebuke for us as a church, but, but maybe somebody here needs to hear this. We got a Facebook um, kind of message uh, last week, I believe, Pastor Eric got it for our church. And uh, it was a private message. It wasn't on display or anything like that. But the message was simply this that um, said, I'm sitting next to a person who claims to go to your church and they're cussing like a sailor. And they're dropping the F-bomb and, um, and they basically told me to off and... Um, you know, and they're claiming to be a member of your church. And if this is the way your church acts, um, then I w- would, w- would not want nothing to do with your church. And, and, you know, when I hear that, I'm like, oh. and I hear, listen, I understand not everybody that walks through our doors is a believer. Okay. Not everybody that comes to our church loves and knows Jesus. Some of us have some struggles for sure. And maybe the way we talk and our language and so on. And maybe those are things that some of us need to definitely work on and, and, you know, kind of allow the Lord to redeem in our lives. But I will, I will say this, um, for us as, as a church, we not only represent our church, but more importantly, we re- represent Jesus Christ. And the conduct that we live and the things that we say and the way that we approach things needs to be indicative of our citizenship of heaven and not of our you know, living here on this earth. And of course, you know, we, you know, Pastor Eric sent him a, a, a reply, you know, this isn't, <laughs> that's not indicative of our church, you know, um, would love to meet you, buy you a coffee, and, and um, if you know that person's name, let us know so we can bring them in for like some church <laughs> discipline, because <laughs> cause I'm, I'm ready for that. But, but I'll say this, man, we've got to make sure, like Paul says, that you let your conduct be worthy of the gospel. That you let your conduct be worthy of the gospel, that the way you walk and the things you say and the way you talk and you, the average person, listen, the average person's view of Jesus is some like guy who lived a long time ago with, with a perm, you know, and, and that he like hovered everywhere he went and he said a bunch of nice things. And, and, and the reality is, is, is man, they're going to look at you. And, and, and I know that's not fair. I know that's not fair. Some of us will be like, you don't want to look at me to see Jesus because I'm going to fail you. But the reality is, is people are going to look at you. And, and so making sure the things you say and the way you live and, and how you uh, walk and how you talk is indicative of your citizenship. And of course, we're all at different places of sanctification, Some of us are a little bit more further on in sanctification. Some of us are a little bit, you know, less in sanctification. But the process of being sanctified on a day-to-day basis, and not that we become, um, you know, religious crazies or anything like that, but making sure we live for Jesus on a day-to-day basis, that our action needs to be worthy of the gospel. And, And that the type of life you live would show the spirit and the love of Jesus Christ. And that, you know, you don't um, be a jerk, okay? Well, I'm I'm suffering for Jesus, and it's because you're you're not suffering for Jesus because, like, you're actually living right. It's because you're a jerk, okay? No, not, not that kind of living, but that you let your conduct be the driving force for the furtherance of the gospel. And he says, he says that as being citizens of heaven, um... He, he reminds us that we're not alone in this. Because notice he says, I hear about you standing fast in one spirit, with one mind striving together. That we need to remember as believers that we've got brothers and sisters around us in order to um, help us on a day-to-day basis. Ecclesiastes puts it this way. A person standing alone can be attacked and defeated, but two can stand back to back and conquer. But three are even better, for a triple braided cord is not easily broken. One of the greatest um, things that God has given us 
is the church. It's the church, not just our church, but the, the Christian church as a whole. And Paul kind of pictures the Christian church here as, as a team. You know, a team that's working together, a team that's striving together. They're not superficial, but spiritual. And, and it's quite literally an athletic term, that word striving together, to remind us that every single person on the team has a job and a responsibility to um, help the team win some victories. It's kind of like in like contemporary sports today, you know, like, like football. You know, when one part of the team isn't doing its job, you lose the game to a four and one team. You know what I mean? Like, I mean, a one and four team. Like, you know, <laughs> when, when people are dropping the ball, you're, or holding, <laughs> 95 yards in penalties. Um, you know, just saying, like when, when one part of the team isn't doing its job, then, then you end up losing. But as believers, you know, we've been called to a church and, and a group of people to um, rally around so that we can win the victories. You know, you see, for example, when a team has a, a, a diva on it or a, or a glory um, hound, you know, somebody that, that's just wanting all the glory for themselves and, and what it can do to a team and how it can sidetrack a, a team. And there's been instances, for example, in the New Testament where you see guys like that. Um, uh, you see guys, for example, like a gentleman in 3 John verse 9 where he wanted the preeminence, uh, John tells us. John wasn't a uh, immune to it himself. Um, remember um, James and John, uh, they went to Jesus and asked uh, Jesus, you know, can we sit at the right hand and the left hand um, in heaven with you, like just next to you on the throne? Actually, they didn't even have the guts to, to ask them, Jesus themselves. They sent their mom to ask Jesus. Can you imagine? Like, Jesus, you see my little, my little hitos over there? Um, my little boys over there, they would love to sit at the right hand and the left hand in heaven. You know, can, can we accommodate that, Jesus? You know, because I'm mama bear. Um, like, that is just, it's, just, it's just crazy, right? But they wanted the glory. And then, what, if you notice, the verses right after that, it says that the disciples then start arguing amongst themselves, that they start, they get angry with one, one another. And, and some, some commentators would say, well, like, it's because, you know, they wanted the, the preeminence. And, and I would say maybe that might be the case. I think they're fighting with one another because they're like, that's a good idea. I should have thought of that one first, you know, because they wanted the preeminence themselves. Listen, the enemy would love nothing more than to divide the church. You could say um, his motto can be summed up in divide and conquer. And the Christian church is, is something that's like nothing else on planet earth. No team, no group, no legion, uh, no organization. And some people say, well, the church is a nonprofit organization. No, no, no. The church is not an organization. It's an organism. We are alive. We are living. We are growing. We are changing. Uh, we are being molded into the image of, of Christ. And so we're not an organization. Um, you know, we're, we're an organism. And, and some people, I, I tell you guys this all the time, some people are like, well, I, I hate organized religion. And that's why you need to invite them to our church because we're totally unorganized, okay? <laughs> because we are. We're just like, things just sometimes don't work, you know? But but the thing is, is, is for us as a church, we, we have an opportunity to stand to get together. This is the reason why um, Jesus prayed for the unity of his church. Remember, the New Testament gives us five prayers of Jesus, like where we actually hear what Jesus specifically prayed. Five prayers in the Gospels. Uh, one of them was, Lord, forgive them for they know not what they do. One was in the Garden of Gethsemane, um, you know, not my will, but your will be done. Uh, and then one of the prayers that Jesus prays is he prays for his future church and that they were, there would be unity amongst his future church. Why? Because Jesus knew that the devil would love to isolate Christians, 
divide and conquer Christians. And so he prays for the unity of his future church that hadn't even existed yet. There were still, you know, the, the church was really just, you know, 12 ragtag, you know, group of, of, of disciples. And one of them was going to betray him soon. Like, um, and, and so it hadn't really spread yet, but he prayed for the future of the church. And we have strength to stand firm in the midst of opposition because of our union in Jesus Christ. And so this is the reason why like a lone ranger Christian mentality is, is, is horrible. Oh, I don't like going to church because there's a bunch of hypocrites there. Well, then come join us, you know? Because, because the reality is, is, is a church, yes, there's, it's filled with sinners, but as believers and as Christians, we, we are called to not forsake the assembling together of, of brothers and sisters in Christ because God knows that in groups we can stand because the devil wants to isolate you. He wants to get you alone. Um, he wants to bring you down. And so you can't be a, a secret agent Christian, you know, all ninja by yourself, you know, like... You know, you've got, to, you've got to make sure you pray and give and go and encourage and invest and support because one of the fastest ways to lose joy in the midst of criticism and in the midst of opposition is when you're alone. Is when you're alone. When, when you have no one else around you, when you have no one to lean on, um, when you have no one that has your back. And this is the why, why the Christian church is so good. This is why Paul would, he would say, he would say, man, well, even that when I, when I come and see you or I am absent, I hear how good you guys are and you're working together. Because you're a team and a team must work together. And, and I love that Paul was able to say, man, I'm not even with you guys and you're still working together. And this is, the, this is the reason why, like, good effective, I would say good effective leadership for a church is... is where even if the pastor's not there, the church still happens and takes place and goes on. Because the church isn't built around uh, a guy, it's built around uh, Jesus Christ and our commonality in the gospel, our commonality in Jesus, our common bond in Jesus. So this way, if I go you know, out after service and I get hit by a bus, guess what's happening next Sunday? Church, right? Service is still taking place. Might be a little sadder, for some of you, maybe a little happier. I don't know, but <laughs> I'm just kidding. But you know what I mean? Like, but we're still having church. Why? Because it's not based off of this. It's based off of Jesus Christ. And, and so, man, teamwork, it's so essential. Unity in a church is so essential. This is why backbiting against one another and, and so on is, is so, um, I would say, demonic. Because it's, it's the enemy wanting to cause division in, in a body. Paul, later on in chapter 4, he would tell um, the two ladies in the church to get along. There was a lady by the name of Eudia and a lady by the name of Syndagy, and they both had um, some conflicting issues with one another. Maybe, you know, Lydia um, or Eudia got put in charge of, you know, the knitting group or something, and Syndagy was jealous of her. Or something. We, I don't know what it was, but there was division between them. Is that not funny? I'm sorry. I'm like, I want to be in charge of the knitting group. Um, but there was division, and that's why Paul would say, man, you guys need to put that away. Because the enemy would love nothing more than to divide and conquer the church. So maintaining joy, because we have people to rely on, we're citizens of heaven. Notice our next point, um, homework, that we have a purpose. He says in verse 28, and not in any way terrified by your adversaries, which is to them a proof of perdition, but to you of salvation. And notice this, and that from God. What he's literally saying is he's saying that opposition, Paul says that uh, opposition is to them for destruction, but for us deliverance or salvation. That when Christians stand together in the face of opposition and criticism, in the, when, when Christians stand together uh, in face of external pressure, something amazing happens. It tells us that for them it's for destruction, but ultimately for us it's for salvation. Um, Paul would say in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 9, he says that a great and effective uh, door has been opened to me and there are many adversaries there. That 
for us, when opposition comes or criticism comes, it builds up us as believers for salvation. This is the reason why whenever the persecuted church, whenever the church is persecuted, you don't see the church diminish, but actually grow in its strength. Um, The first 300 years of Christianity where Christians were being slaughtered in the Colosseum by gladiators and animals and being um, crucified for uh, their faith and being lit on fire in Nero's gardens and, and so on, Christianity didn't shrink. It doubled in size. It, it grew. For example, you see it in China today, where Christianity is opposed, but Christianity is growing like crazy. Uh, Iran, they're... they're you know, when you read some of the, the stories that are taking place, uh, Iran, where Christianity is illegal, there are, um, uh, man, thousands upon thousands of stories of Muslim men and women who are coming to faith because they're having visions of Jesus. You know, this is, these are things that are biblically speaking happening today in our presence. And, and so when, when you see the opposition come, For them, it's their destruction, but for us, it's salvation, it's deliverance. Um, It gives us a reason and a purpose. And so we shouldn't be alarmed by opposition. We shouldn't be alarmed by it. Matthew 10, 28 says this, Jesus says, um, Do not fear those who can kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who is able to destroy both body and soul in hell. Meaning, Meaning this, that as Christians... You shouldn't be afraid of the devil and or his cohorts and or your enemies because ultimately we'll be free. Remember, when you come to know Jesus, like I said earlier, you automatically get a bullseye on your back. The, the idea that, well, come to know Jesus and, and life's going to be perfect and it's going to be good and, and great and, and they're going to be... Um, snowmen and you know summer and you know like frozen anyone yes okay um you know what i mean like it's going to be awesome and and the reality is is that's not the case and it, it people don't like to say that the moment you become a christian you do get a bullseye on your back because anything that god loves the devil hates and god loved you so much that he would send his one and only son to die on the cross for you and if that's the case you can be certain that the devil's not going to like you so he's going to send fiery darts towards you because the devil hates you he's a hater he drinks haterade okay so <laughs> So he doesn't want you to have a good relationship with Jesus. He wants to remove the joy in your heart and in your life. He wants you to be isolated and alone. And so this is why Paul says, listen, we have a purpose. That when opposition comes, criticism comes, these things come against us, man, we, we grow, we excel, it's for our salvation, and that we're able to one day ultimately enjoy it eternally. And then notice he says, and this is from God. This is from God. That the present sufferings are nothing in compared to what we have in the future. And sometimes we lose our joy because as believers, we haven't done our homework. We haven't done our homework. We haven't read. We haven't studied to show ourselves approved. We haven't gotten into God's word and and prayed and and been around brothers and sisters in Christ in order to know that when those things come, I can stand. And even even if cancer takes me out of this world, old age takes me out of this world, um, a bus takes me out of this world, or, or I die as a martyr for Christ, that one day I get to be in heaven. And that one day I get eternity. So no matter what happens, I get to be with the Lord. And so this is why you've got to make sure, man, you, you don't give up, or you don't give in, but you give it all you got. Don't give up, don't give in, but give it all you got. Give your heart to God. Give your life to God. Give your relationships to God. Give, give your, um, your, your friendships to God. Give your, your bank account to God. But don't give up. And don't give in. Because remember, outlook determines outcome. And the problem is never your problem. 
It's the attitude about your problem. So don't give up and don't give in. And just because bad things are happening around me doesn't mean that bad things need to happen inside of me. Just because bad things are happening around me doesn't mean bad things are hap- need to happen inside of me. There can be a lot of bad things happening around me, but, but I've determined in my heart that Jesus rules and reigns in my life, and so I can maintain joy in my heart no matter the things that are going on against me, no matter the darkness around me, no matter the, the sicknesses within me, no matter what, what is taking place. And remember that because ultimately God gets the last word. And our last point here, notice verse 29 through 30. Firework. For to you it has been granted on behalf of Christ not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for his sake, having the same conflict which you saw in me, and now here is in me. Do do you realize what Paul is saying there? It might surprise you. He quite literally is saying, not only do you get to believe in Jesus but you get to suffer for him too. And it's a gift. You're like, wait, 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 wait. Suffering is a gift? It's a gift. Not only do you get to believe in Jesus, but you get to suffer for him and it's gonna be awesome. <laughs> and for some of us, that doesn't make any, any sense. It sounds weird. How is um, suffering a gift? Well, ultimately, if we're suffering for ourselves, it's pointless. But if we're suffering for a purpose, for Jesus, it's powerful. You know, Christianity is hard and it's difficult. Um, Remember, the symbol for the Christian faith is what? The cross. It's the cross. And what is the cross? A means of execution. It's really what it is. Today, we, you know, we, we make them fancy, we, we get tattoos of them, and we put them on chains, and, and you know, so on. But could you imagine, like, just getting a, uh, an electric chair in gold and wearing it? People would be like, yeah, that's kind of morbid. Morbid guy, man, yeah. Like. But, but that quite literally is the case. It, uh, the cross is a means of execution, and it became the, the, symbol, the symbol for the Christian faith based off of the events that took place on the cross because of what Jesus did for us. This is why in Mark chapter 8, um, when Jesus is talking to Peter, there, he's talking about how in the future, Peter's going to have to die for, for Jesus. He's going to have to suffer for him. And Peter, if you remember the story, Peter's like, what about John? And, and, and Jesus tells Peter, if I have John to live forever, you know, so be it. You are going to have to suffer for me. And John's like, yes, I'm not going to die. You know, like, and, and we know John would be, um, he would be thrown in oil and he would be exiled to Patmos. But John would be the only guy that, of the disciples that would die a natural death. Um, Peter, we know, would be crucified. According to church history, was crucified upside down because he didn't believe he was worthy to die like his Lord, right side up. And so ultimately, the, for the Christian faith, the Calvary road is narrow and hard. And so not only do you get to believe in Jesus, but you get to suffer for him as well. And so for us, we get to view it like a badge of honor. Like a, like a badge of honor. Every year, 4th of July, we send off fireworks um, basically because, you know, we, we were ungrateful colonists. You know what I mean? And, and so we, we set off fireworks in, in view of a Independence Day. And that's the way the early church saw their, their suffering as a badge of honor. Acts 5 verse 41 says this. And they departed from the presence of the council rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer for his name's sake. And so when you suffer, when you're opposed, when you're criticized, view it like a badge of honor, like a firework. Like this is something, a flare in the, you know, in the ocean or, um, you know, like the great theologian Katy Perry said, baby, you're a firework. Okay. Like, oh, but come on, show them what. Okay. Um, 
but that, you, that, <laughs> that you're on display so that you count it worthy. You suffer. You got to believe in Jesus, but you got to suffer for Jesus. And that when you do suffer for Jesus, it's a gift. You got to be on display that you let your light shine before men, that you glow in the dark, that you, even in the midst of those things, can, can show the love and grace and mercy of Christ. See, Satan wants you to believe that you're alone in your battle and that your difficulties are unique, but they're not. There's nothing new under the sun. And, and, and so, you know, the, the things that you're suffering, the, the feeling isolated, not having joy, um, your marriage is hurting right now, your, your employer's giving you a hard time, your neighbors or family members are, are just wreaking havoc on you. You can come in and say, listen, I count it all joy when I, when I suffer in these things. Like Paul will say later on in Philippians chapter 3, he'll, he'll, say, he'll say that I might know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering, the fellowship of his suffering, being conformed to his death, if by any means I might obtain the resurrection of the dead. The idea, the fellowship of his suffering is not that, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to understand Jesus' suffering. And there was a, a guy, I believe, um, I read in... In the news, I think it was in Boston after The Passion of the Christ came out. If you guys remember that movie, The Passion of the Christ came out, and he uh, uh, nailed himself to a board. He did this, but then he realized he couldn't complete the job, you know? And, and people asked him, like, what were you doing? He's like, I just wanted to know what Jesus felt like as he was being crucified. And, and that's not what Paul is talking about here. Um, the fellowship of his suffering is that quite literally, as, as believers, um, we're going to have to endure hardship. Um, that when we sin, our heart would break the way Jesus' heart breaks over our sin. Um, that as Paul would say, you know, that we endure hardships such as stonings and hungers and prisons and, and in those moments that we count it such as a privilege. That we count it a privilege. I think of David Livingston. He was a pioneer missionary in Africa. And uh, of his life, it said that he's, he walked over 29,000 miles um, ministering to people in Africa. Uh, his wife died at an early age. He faced stiff opposition from the Scottish churches um, that, that he was from. He ministered half blind. And he uh, wrote in his diary this. He said, Lord, send me anywhere. Only go with me. Lay any burden on me, only sustain me. Sever me from any tie, but the tie that binds me to your service and to your heart. And for us, that's a, it's a beautiful picture of, of how we should view our life. God, you know what? Throw anything on my shoulders, just sustain me. God, you know, send me anywhere you want me to go, just be with me. Because following Jesus means you will face various forms of conflict and opposition, being mocked, insulted, ignored, and each and every single time, it's a privilege. It's a privilege. Full citizenship of heaven involves the grace of believing, but also the grace of suffering. So let your conduct be worthy of that, of the gospel. As we close, two things I'd like to take from um, this morning's message Number one, you need to remember that belief fuels behavior. Belief fuels behavior. Paul starts off by saying, let your conduct be worthy of the gospel. Well, your conduct is based off of the gospel. The way you live is based off of what Jesus has done for you. And so as a believer, this is the very foundation of who, who we are. And it's important that we get this because um, what you believe guides how you will act towards other people, places, things, and in certain situations. What you believe will determine how you act in those things. And it's very important to, to, to dig your beliefs out of the background of your mind and say, okay, what do I truly believe? And make sure that our belief is fueling our behavior. You know, as we... Um, Think about, like, God, do you, do you view God as someone who's angry with you, mad at you? If that's the case, then you're going to always be critical of yourself. Now, growing up, I, I've told you guys this before. Growing up, I, I remember uh, my, my family coming in, and I had said a lie. And, and I remember my family um, looking at me and like, you know, God hates liars. 
And so I, inevitably in my heart, I was like, I made the connection at five years old. If God hates liars and I'm a liar, that means God hates me. And I made that connection at, at like five. And I, I just remember thinking God was mad at me. He hated me. And, but if you, if you view God that way, then, then man, you're not going to have joy. But if you view God as, as a loving father who cares for us, as Paul would say in Ephesians, who wants to do exceedingly abundantly above all that you could ask or think, uh, a God who, who would send his only son to die for us, a, a God who desires relationship with us, then it will determine how you live that out. If you believe he's going to criticize you, then you're going to behave cautiously. If you believe that you're going to fail, then you're not going to step out in faith. And, and, and I put a list together that you can't expect to be understood and obedient at the same time. You, you can't do what God wants you to do and avoid conflict because those will go hand in hand. You can't expect God to always make sense because sometimes things don't add up on paper. It, it just sometimes it doesn't add up. You can't get to the next level without sacrifice in your life. You can't follow Jesus and remain the same. You can't. If you're really going to truly follow Jesus, you're going to be changed. You can't make a significant impact in the world if you're always playing defense. You can't honor God by trying your best to be someone else. You need to be who God has called you to be. You can't play it safe and please God. You know, I know Hebrews tells us without faith, it's impossible to please God. So faith sometimes means, you know, not, not being able to um, play it safe. You can't avoid the tough decisions and make progress. You can't expect to impact the world if you're attempting to answer questions no one is asking. And you can't fail if you're doing what God has called you to do. If you're doing what God has called you to do, sometimes you need to remember that what you believe determines how you behave, and ultimately, it's who you become. And lastly, and we'll close with this one, you need to remember to hold the line. Hold the line. Don't give up. Don't give in. Paul mentions that we're going to suffer and that you need to count it as a, as a gift. Listen, some people don't like God, and they're not going to like God in you. You know how I know? Jesus told us. <laughs> John 15, if the world hates you, know that it hated me before it hated you. Jesus knew. And what will end up happening is, is as you live your life, you're going to face criticism and opposition. There'll be people that will not like you at work. There'll be people that will be jealous of your marriage or your ministry or your job. And there'll be people, they'll have hatred and jealousy and ridicule. And sometimes doing God's will will bring opposition. And when you do that, people are going to squawk and squeak and complain, send an email or gossip or malign you. Or, and that's the way it goes. So be of good cheer. Be encouraged. If you love God and you're serving him and you're living for him, someone somewhere is going to be ticked off about that. So hold the line. Don't give up. Don't give in. There can be no glory without suffering, no fruitful life without death, and no victory without surrender. Paul put it this way in 2 Corinthians. We're hard-pressed on every side, but we're not crushed. We're perplexed, but not in despair. We're persecuted, but we're not forsaken. We're struck down, but not destroyed. That as believers, ultimately, our suffering, our perplexity, our hardships are for his glory. And that you count it as, as a gift. How will you respond when those things come? And don't try to vindicate yourself. Augustine said, oh Lord, deliver me from the lust of vindicating myself. Sometimes we want to stand up and defend ourselves. No, no, no. We let the Lord defend us. Because my name isn't worth defending. It's his name. This is the reason why I want to make sure I live my life in such a way that is worthy of the conduct of the gospel. 
that joy in the midst of opposition should lead us to teamwork, unity, homework, purpose, fireworks, letting our light shine, and that we experience this joy ultimately because of Jesus. Let's pray. Dear God, I thank you, dear Jesus, for your word, that you have given it to us, that we can learn and grow and serve and honor you. And this morning, dear Jesus, I know that some of us are at different points in our life with you. Maybe you're here this morning and you don't know Jesus. You don't have a right relationship with him. Let me tell you, God loved you so much, he would send his son to die on the cross for you. And you don't get to heaven by being nice or being a good person. It's only by having a right relationship with Jesus. And so this morning, we want to give you an opportunity to do just that, to meet him, connect with him, have a, a, a right relationship with him. If that's you, I, I would ask that you would have the courage to raise your hand today so that we can acknowledge it and pray for you. Maybe you're here this morning and... Um, Man, you've been facing it, criticism, hardship, pain, opposition, and it seems like you've lost your joy. You believe in Jesus, yes, but, but you're, you feel isolated. Let me tell you, you've got brothers and sisters all around you right now that want to love you, a church that cares for you. If that's you, can you raise your hand so I can pray for you as well? Just you're at work, an employer, or a neighbor, or... Oh, man, I see a bunch of hands around. Dear God, I thank you for those hands that are raised, dear Jesus. And right now, they're going through it. There's opposition and suffering and criticism. I pray, dear God, that as they view it a privilege to believe in you, that they would view it as a privilege to suffer for you. But I pray, dear God, that the circumstances around them would not take the joy within their heart. And so, dear God, we give you this morning. We pray that you would bless them, that you would be with them, that there would be a hand to go around their shoulders and hug them today. I pray, dear God, for, um, for that. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand.